Good morning. You're at Long Meadow. You're very welcome as we gather uh, this remembrance morning. And as we come to this morning to worship God, we do so in the midst of a turbulent world, don't we? For some of us, that turbulence is what we see on the national or the international stage with concerns about conflict or economics or climate. For others of us, that turbulence is felt much closer to home with struggles over finance or health or relationships, friends or family. It's hard not to feel unsettled in our world at the moment. So listen to God's word this morning from Psalm 62. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honour depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. There are two wonderful reminders uh, there, here, aren't there? Firstly, the obvious one, that God is our rock and our refuge, a fixed point amid so much uncertainty, the one who holds us close so that we will not be shaken. He is our rescuer, our salvation. But secondly, don't miss that he doesn't expect serenity and calm from those who trust him. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him. For God is our refuge. You don't need to have everything sorted to come to him. Quite the reverse. He invites you to pour out your heart to him, not to say the right things. So as we come to him this morning, before we sing our first song, let's take a moment, each to ourselves, young and old, to be real with him. But maybe some of that turbulence that we feel at the moment. And to ask him to help us to fix our eyes on him once more. Moment of quiet for each of us. So we're going to sing our opening song together. It is a call to rejoice but not a call to rejoice as if everything is okay. Some of us will have wept through this past night, but he remains our refuge, our rock, the defeater of death. He is our risen king. If you're able, please stand and we'll sing together.
continue to rejoice in our next song, which on the words we fix our eyes on the one who is our refuge, the one to whom we can draw near in confidence, the one who bends to bless us with his unrelenting love. And the one who as the end of this song reminds us is the one who sees our tears as we pour out our hearts to him and who hears our voice. Let's sing together. turn our eyes once more this morning towards our maker and our redeemer we seek to fill our gaze with him our refuge because it is in him that we find strength for another day whatever that day may bring
take a seat. So we have filled our thoughts this morning with God, our refuge and our rescuer, the one who is the defender of the weak, the comforter of those in need. And we're going to turn those thoughts to prayer now. We're going to spend a few moments in prayer in smaller groups around the church for those that we know are currently experiencing the turbulence of life. But as we pray for them, let's not simply pray for the easing of their situation. It's good to do that, but struggle will come again. Let's pray instead that they would fill their eyes with the God who is there for them and with them. They would know that he is their refuge and their rock. Or perhaps you want to pray that for yourself if life is feeling hard at the moment. But it would be great if you were to turn it into smaller groups of people just around you. If you'd rather not do that, that's fine. Just bow your head and people will know to leave you alone at that point. But we're just going to spend a few moments in prayer for those that we know who are in need at the moment. In our next song, we're going to remind ourselves of our identity and our security in God, that we are his children and he is always with us in each and every circumstance. And so therefore, we praise him. If you're able to, let's stand and we'll sing together.
it's in the light of that identity that we have as God's children that we sing the song that we were learning earlier on, the invitation to the broken to come and see what he has done, that he has sent his son into this world out of love for us, to rescue us, to give us a hope and a future. He welcomes the weary, the struggling, the guilty, the battered and bruised, the fearful, and he promises peace. So let's sing together. It's in the context of remembering that God has come into our broken world that we pause for our minute silence this morning, this Remembrance Day. The Prince of Peace has come. So in the silence, let's pray that he would reign in our hurting world and that as Emmanuel, God with us, he would draw near to those who are suffering because of conflict and war in the present and those still suffering because of wars in the past. If you're able, please remain standing for our minute silence as we remember.
gracious, kind and sovereign God. We thank you that you have not stood far off and distant from this hurting and broken world. We thank you that you have gone, uh, come and got involved in the birth, the death, the resurrection of your son, the Lord Jesus, and your ongoing presence by your spirit in our world today. Lord, we bring before you our broken, hurting world in desperate need of the Prince of Peace, the one needed to bring peace, not simply horizontally, but also with you. And Lord, we pray that he would be at work. Lord, we thank you for good news received just recently of the peace in Ethiopia with the Tigray rebels. We thank you for bringing an end uh, through an, uh, a ceasefire to that conflict that has raged for these past two years. We pray, Lord, that the aid that is needed to get into that region would get there quickly and to the right people. And Lord, we ask that that peace would be maintained and carry on, that there would be a lasting peace. We bring before you once again the country of Ukraine and pray that you would bring peace there as well. Lord, we pray that you would stay the hands of violent men. And Lord, we pray that in the midst of all this turmoil, that you would draw close and make yourself known. That as we see again so clearly that this world is not what it should be, that we would long for a rescuer. We ask too that you would help each one of us to see our need for rescue too. We thank you that you have provided that through the Lord Jesus. And so Lord, we pray you would help us in the midst of a turbulent and broken world to keep on trusting him, to live for him, and to know that there is better still to come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you please take a seat? Let me tell you about a few things that are coming up in the next uh, week uh, or so. Uh, this evening, we continue our series uh, thinking about the end times. Uh, so five o'clock this afternoon for the second session uh, here. If you didn't make it last week, uh, that uh, session is available to watch online. There's a link in the notices for that, and you can come uh, along and uh, uh, pick things up uh, from this afternoon. Uh, we also have our community lunch uh, this uh, Tuesday from 12 uh, till 2. If you're able to be there, that would be great. But if you are able to be there, it would be really helpful if you were to let Gemma know uh, so that she can make sure there's enough food uh, for all of us uh, at that occasion. And then next Saturday is our celebration for Michael's birthday at half past two. If you're able to be at that, do let Barbara know. Barbara, give us a wave. Uh, do let Barbara know if you're able to uh, come along uh, to that uh, as well. 2.30 next Saturday. Steph, come and tell us a bit about uh, Bridge Builders. Uh, quite a few of you will know that I work for an organisation called Bridge Builders, which is a mission organisation that works in Stevenage. Uh, we go into primary schools and do assemblies. And we also have two projects, one of which uh, is the Christmas journey, which surprisingly enough is coming up soon. Uh, we have 960 year two children who are six and seven year olds uh, coming into two churches and uh, accessing the journey virtually as well. Uh, so uh, the churches tend to need volunteers from other churches as well. Um, so if you are happy to volunteer, please come and talk to me. Week one is Monday the 28th of November for that week. And the second week is the week after that. So um, volunteers are always uh, needed. Thank you. Um, and also as part of our fundraising, uh, we sell Christmas cards just before Christmas. There are some outside. Uh, oh, hold that one the right way up. Uh, three pounds for a pack of 10. There's a pot that you can put some money in, please. Uh, is there anything else? Say? No, please pray for us as we do this. Uh, there's, you know, often a few technical difficulties and things Things don't go quite as smoothly as they should do. So um, please pray for the Christmas journey. Thank you. And as you buy your Christmas cards from Bridge Builders, you might want to have a look uh, down here. There's a whole bunch of uh, useful Christmas tracks that you can take away and you can give those to neighbours or you can stick them in a Christmas card to send to friends as well. Do help yourselves to those uh, after, after the service. Uh, let's pray, uh, shall we? Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity that the Christmas journey gives to tell uh, year two children of the wonder of Jesus coming, the King who has come to rescue. And Lord, we pray that you will be enough volunteers uh, to run those at the two churches that are running them. And we ask for both children and teachers that they come along, that they would see the wonder of what Christmas is really all about, the entrance of God into this world. Please would you be with all those who are involved and would you use them 
as they make the Lord Jesus known. And Lord, we pray for all of us uh, here in the building, for young and old, for those watching online, that you would show each one of us in our different uh, uh, groups exactly uh, some more of who Jesus is, that we might love him more dearly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, it is time now for the children to head out for their groups uh, through that door. And uh, while they're on the way out, why don't you turn to someone around you and say, good morning. We're going to turn once again to Mark's Gospel this morning as we continue our series through that. Um, we've reached partway through Mark chapter 4, uh, which is on page 1006 if you're using one of the church Bibles. We've been reflecting that today is Remembrance Day. On a day like that, in the midst of a world where uh, so much of life seems difficult, from the international to the national to our own immediate scene, uh, hope is a precious and perhaps an elusive thing for some of us. Where is the good news? An imminent football World Cup, maybe? It feels a bit like clutching at straws, to be honest, doesn't it? Um, we can make a, a joke of the expense of English football hopes, but actually that only deflects our, uh, our concerns for a moment, doesn't it? Because reality still awaits just outside that door, and we live in a messed up world, and we experience its reality, and sometimes hope can feel like it's a long way off. When Jesus appeared on the scene at the beginning of Mark's Gospel, he announced good news because the kingdom of God had come near. It was the hope that people longed for. But they could have been forgiven for wondering quite early on if it was really all that hopeful. Because as you read through the, just the first opening chapters of Mark's Gospel, you realise that Jesus has experienced opposition right from the beginning most notably from the Pharisees, who are already plotting to kill him. Is God's kingdom really come near, they might have asked? The Romans still rule, life is still hard, and whilst Jesus is drawing crowds, it's true, much of them appear to be just watching, not really following him. We began last week by thinking of what can feel like a, a reality gap between Sunday morning and Monday morning when so much of the world seems to ignore and reject Jesus, leaving us perhaps wondering if this good news is all it's cracked up to be. But we also saw that last week that Jesus isn't afraid of questions like that. And actually, he preempted them with his parable of the sower, telling his disciples that they should expect different reactions to the good news, but also promising a harvest. Well, he's not finished talking about that issue uh, yet. We kind of, we broke off last week, halfway through, partway through a, a series of parables around that theme that Mark was recounting for us. So we're going to pick up where we left off. Uh, Mark chapter 4 and verse 21, page 1006. So Jesus is continuing. He said to them, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on, a, on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever, whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. He also said, uh, th this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows there. He does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. 
As soon as the grain, grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what should we say the kingdom of God is like? What parable should we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything. So you'll remember that last week <clears throat> we saw two key things. We saw the division brought by God's words between those who hear and come to Jesus to find out more and those who don't. And we also saw the growth of the kingdom, that an abundant harvest is promised, 30, 60, even 100 times what is shown. We're going to see both those ideas again this week in these couple of parables. And I think in verse 21, we're picking up Jesus' teaching where we, we kind of left off at the end of verse 9. So uh, verses 10 to 20, Mark has inserted a later exchange with the disciples where Jesus explains it all. That comes later on, but Mark has stuck it in there. And now here in verse 21, we're back in front of the crowds again, sowing the word. I think that's the audience, the crowd as a whole once again, because Jesus speaks in parables to the crowd. He tells us that at the end of the passage. And we also, we have that repeated phrase, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. It's the invitation that Jesus gives to all to take his word seriously and to come to him to hear it more fully. And it is the centrality of the person of Jesus which is key to those first two sayings in verses 21 to 25. Because what we have here is another reminder of the heart of the kingdom. It is he, it is Jesus, as we saw last week, who is the secret of the kingdom of God, who has now been revealed. And that's important for our understanding of these first couple of verses. He talks here about a lamp and being put under a bowl or being put up on, on, on display. And you might at first glance think that this lamp idea is a reference to the disciples and their need to shine for Jesus. And Jesus does indeed use that illustration in Matthew chapter 5. But I don't think that's what Jesus means here. Because the NIV has uh, uh, attempted to smooth out some slightly awkward language in the way it's, it's translated. So literally what this reads is, the lamp does not come to be put under a bowl. Which sounds a bit odd, because lamps don't come. Lamps are brought by someone else, aren't they? Unless you're watching Beauty and the Beast. They're brought, hence the way that uh, the NIV has translated that. Unless, of course, like in Beauty and the Beast, the lamp is representing an individual. And Jesus uses the definite article here. He doesn't say a lamp has come. He says the lamp has come. And that, together with the context of what we've just seen last week, that Jesus himself is the revealed secret of God's kingdom, points towards the fact, I think, that Jesus is the lamp here. That Jesus has come to show himself, to reveal himself, to be made known. The lamp comes to bring light. More than that, actually, the lamp is the light. Are you listening, says Jesus to the crowd? Or he might equally have said, can you see? Look at who is in front of you at the moment. Look around you at the victories over sickness and over Satan as the demons are cast out. Can you see who is here amongst you? If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. And then he presses that, home, that point home further in verse 24. He follows that up with, consider carefully what you hear. This matters, says Jesus. This matters because it's, it's all or nothing with me. I wonder if as we read those verses through, you thought that Jesus' declaration in verse 25 seems a touch unfair, doesn't it? Whoever has will be given more, and whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. 
surely Jesus, a bit more redistribution of the wealth will be more appropriate, sharing things out a little. Isn't that what you're supposed to do? But the key phrase is that first one, consider carefully what you hear. It's both an invitation and a warning to those who are listening. And what follows on is simply a, a spelling out of what is happening in front of Jesus. The word is sown before the crowd as he tells his parables. The question is, how will they respond? Those who come to Jesus will hear more, they will see more, and they will get more of him. It's a virtuous circle. Those who listen see light, and those who see light listen more. But those who turn away, they will have nothing. It's all or nothing with Jesus. You come to him and you have everything. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Or you turn your back and you have nothing. See, once again, as we saw last week, there is no neutral position, is there? There is no halfway house. Which means I have to ask the question of us to, again today, are you listening to Jesus? Are you listening to Jesus? Are you coming towards him? Now, hear this carefully. This is not a threat to those who are trying to follow Jesus, but finding it hard. This is not a warning to, from Jesus to, to buck up your ideas or you'll find yourselves out on the ear. Remember the limitless patience that Jesus has to show to his often slow and questioning disciples. You read through the rest of Mark's gospel, they are hardly shiny examples of consistent spiritual fervour, commitment and understanding. They get it wrong time and time again. And remember, we've just seen last week that their understanding is still far from complete at this point. They come asking for an explanation of the parable. They don't know what it means. But the key thing is they come towards Jesus. It all hinges on this. It is about our response to Jesus, towards or away, which is all important. So consider carefully what you hear. If you're here today or if you're listening at home online, this is God's word and it shows us Jesus. Consider carefully what you hear. You can't have a little bit of spirituality in your life. Still less can you have a little bit of Jesus. He announces God's kingdom because he is God's king. So what will you do with him? Because it is all about him. And it is all or nothing with him. Consider carefully what you hear. And then we have two very simple parables here about the growth of the kingdom, building on that, that picture of, of the abundant harvest that we saw in the parable of the sower. And the first one is all about God's unseen work. This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces corn, first the stalk, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. As soon as the corn is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. See, a freshly sown field doesn't look very impressive. Not for quite a long time. It's just brown and muddy. You might think after a little while, well, the farmer was just wasting his time, wasn't he? There's nothing is happening, nothing going on. But of course, the seed is germinating unseen below the surface. And in due time, as Jesus tells us, the stalk pushes its way through that surface. And then eventually there follows a field full of crops ready for the harvest. Chess is not a great spectator sport for most of us. I went to a chess championship once. Um, I'm not very into chess. I think mainly because I'm just not very good at it. But my brother-in-law is, a, is a, key, a keen player, and Jonah has always had an aptitude for, uh, for the game from a young age. And he invited us to come along, and so we went along to watch some chess being played. 
I have to say it didn't really do it for me, if I'm honest. It felt like I was watching a bunch of blokes sitting opposite each other around small tables. And the most dramatic thing that was happening was that occasionally one of them would put their head in their hands. It wasn't quite like going to a football or a rugby match, and the atmosphere certainly wasn't quite the same. But here's the thing. I could therefore dismiss chess completely, couldn't I? At least with football or rugby, there's a ball to watch, even if the standard of play isn't that great. But in chess, nothing is happening. But of course, I'd be completely wrong about that. I can't see much happening, but beneath the surface, underneath some of the frankly dodgy haircuts, underneath the surface, there was loads happening. There were positions being analysed and decisions being made and rejected and plans formulated and scenarios considered and the future expected and strategies developed. All the stuff that I can't do, which is why I'm not very good at chess. There was loads going on. I just couldn't see it. See, the growth of the kingdom of God may be partly unseen, but that doesn't mean nothing is happening. That doesn't mean nothing is happening because God is the one at work. God is at work. Did you notice how Jesus draws attention to the fact that after sowing, the, the sower himself does nothing? He doesn't even know exactly how the whole, whole process is taking it works. Now at this point, before the gardeners amongst us start howling in protest at the dismissal of their skills, calm down. Jesus is making a simple point here through this parable, uh, as, through a simple illustration. He's not casting aspersions on the agricultural know-how of every Palestinian farmer at the time. He's making a very simple point. But his point is important for those who are listening, for those who will be spreading the word. It is God who does the work. And it is unseen and out of sight, but it is God who brings the harvest. I've lost count of the number of Christian testimonies I've heard where someone has referenced a Christian from earlier in their life, perhaps years, decades before, who, who'd said something or did something which made them think and has only now come back to their minds. A seed which was sown all that time before and which, likely as not, the sower themselves thought was a complete waste of time and brought no fruit whatsoever. They might as well not have bothered. But those conversations that you and I have had over the years with family and friends, with neighbours and work colleagues, those things that you have said about Jesus which seem to have made no difference at all, and you might as well not have bothered. But who knows what God is doing? Who knows what God is doing with that seed to bring about his harvest? We'll find out one day. You see, it's God who is at work. God who does the work, not you. It's God who grows his kingdom. And it's God who brings the harvest. So keep sowing. Keep sowing. You don't know what's going on under the surface. But you do know that God can open blind eyes to see the glory of his son. Because look what he did for you. And then Jesus' second parable here makes a similarly simple point. Big things come from small beginnings. Again, he said, what should we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable should we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. Now, once again, gardeners, calm down. We don't have Jesus writing a gardening textbook here. Yes, there are seeds that are smaller than a mustard seed. But in common speech at the time, if you said something was small, you said it was the size of a mustard seed. And yes, there are garden plants that will grow larger. But the contrast between such a tiny seed and such a huge bush is what Jesus is talking about here. Big things come from small beginnings. And a couple of years after he said this, a bunch of nervous, frightened disciples huddled in a locked upper room. Didn't look like the most auspicious start for the Christian church, did it? Actually, more significantly still, a battered, bloodied and dying man nailed to a Roman cross, the victim of a coordinated campaign of hate and injustice, did not look like a display of God's glory or the rescue of billions of people. 
but that's precisely what it was. Big things from small beginnings, because God is the one who's at work. It's not difficult to feel small as a Christian, is it? To feel like you're in the minority. To think that you as an individual and the church as a whole can easily appear, appear pretty weak and unimpressive, really. But mustard seeds don't look much like much either, do they? God has promised an abundant harvest and he is working his purposes out in his time according to his will. And actually, we stand now 2,000 years on from when Jesus first delivered this parable, which means we have a better view of what he was promising than it did his disciples standing around him. Take a look around you. We have a, see a global church which continues to grow because God is not finished yet. Not across the world. And not here in Stevenage either. So keep sowing. Keep sowing and be expectant because big things come from small beginnings. And it's all about the person of Jesus. It's all about the person of Jesus and listening to him. That's where Mark returns as he closes this set of parables. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. Jesus spoke uh, with many similar parables. Jesus spoke the word to them. He might have said he sowed the word, mightn't he? As much as they could understand. Actually, literally, what it says here is as much as they could hear. And so it echoes that phrase that Jesus has been using throughout. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. So using the word understanding makes it sound like it's something that we have to figure out for ourselves, don't we? Like it's some kind of test of intelligence, but it's not. Remember, the disciples didn't get the parable, but they asked. They came to Jesus. And Mark reminds us of that again here. When he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. He did not say anything to them, the crowd at large, without using a parable. The disciples don't get it but they come to him and he explains it all. The key to the kingdom of God is to see that Jesus is the key to the kingdom of God. It's all about him. It's that simple. And so we seek to make him known. And as we seek to make him known, it is God who is at work to bring that abundant harvest that he's promised. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for opening our eyes to see who Jesus is. Thank you that you have drawn us to your son. We acknowledge once again, it's not because we are particularly good or particularly wise, that we have great understanding or spiritual fervor, but because of your grace, because of your goodness towards us. And so we're thankful. And Lord, we pray that as we are thankful for drawing us to yourself, say therefore we pray you would make us expectant that you would draw others to yourself too. And we ask that you would use us to sow seeds, that the Spirit might do his work and open blind eyes to see the glory of the Lord Jesus. And we pray this so that he might indeed be more and more glorified in this world and the next. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again of the treasure that we have. We remind ourselves that it is God who has shone his light into our hearts. It is God who does his work through his spirit to show others his son too. And so we seek to make Jesus known and the wonder and glory of his grace. If you're able, please stand and we'll sing together.
have beaten Sunday school to it this morning. So that will give us an opportunity to begin our conversations while we're waiting here. And when the doors open, when they're finished, we can go through for tea and coffee. And grab some Christmas tracks on the way out as well. There are also Christmas cards are through on the left as you go out through there. And we had our prayer breakfast this morning. And as part of that, there's a whole bunch of uh, books out there for kids on prayer. Some prayer books they can use and that you can read through with them. They're all free on the table out there. Do have a look. And if you've got uh, children, grandchildren, uh, nephews, nieces, neighbours with children, whatever, do help yourself uh, to those books that are out there. Let me pray for us and then we'll sit. Father, we thank you for the good news that we have to share. Please would you be at work in and through us that we might shine out for the lamp who has come that others might see who he is and give us faith and trust that you are the one who is at work by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please take a seat.